Hey, what's up, church? I'm happy to worship with you today, and it's a good day. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Yeah.
the power yours is the glory forever Hello friends, my name is John Morgan. Our pronouns are he and him. And I first just want to give a, a shout out of thanks and praise for an amazing worship together last Sunday at our outdoor worship celebration. Now, I'm not gonna lie, it was a little bit toasty outside. I, I got sunburn on my face and my arms and my legs, but, but that doesn't take away from uh, the fact that we really felt the presence of, of, of the Holy Spirit throughout the day, through, throughout worship, and then it carried over during our fellowship time as we, as we had a cookout together. Uh, whenever we gather for in-person worship, I, I think my favorite part, you know, I, I love it all. I love the music. I, I, I love the prayers. Uh, um, my favorite part seems to be the testimonies because we hear from uh, straight from people's hearts this past week Mia gave a testimony uh, about how she came to know Jesus and eventually how uh, how she um, got connected with Hope Collective Church well what I what I find intriguing about all the testimonies it, it speaks to my life because I think we all ask the questions at least one time or another God where are you and God what are you up to <laughs> If you've asked those questions, you're, you're not alone, right? In fact, uh, we're going to talk about that a lot this summer. God, what are you up to? What? And, and, and we're going to be focusing on this series called God at Work. And specifically, we're going to spend time in these books of the Old Testament called First and Second Samuel. We'll see how God was at work in the life of Samuel and David. And our goal is to discover how God is working among us today. Well, we'll start off in 1 Samuel chapter 3, but before we get there, I, I was wondering, have you ever thought you heard God, but you weren't sure if that was God's voice that you heard? Or have you ever had that feeling like, maybe this is God, but then you thought, well, maybe it was last night's pizza. My youth pastor used to say, so is it God or is it just gas? And that's a silly question, right? But I think it's, I think it's valid because how do, we, how do we know what we're hearing is God? How can we decipher God's call in our life? Well, leading up to 1 Samuel chapter 3, we read about a man named Elkanah who had two wives, Panina and Hannah. Now, let's not get caught up in the fact that he had two wives. That's a conversation for another day, and we'll, we'll have that conversation someday. But what we need to know is that Panina had children, and Hannah did not, and she desired to have children. And uh, we read that she was in the temple one day, and she prayed with so much passion to God that, that God would give her a son, and she promised if God would give her a son, then, then she would give the son back to God. She was praying with so much passion that Eli, the priest, thought that she had been drinking too much. Well, guess what? God answered her prayer and gave her a son, and she called the son Samuel. That was the name. And when Samuel was old enough to stop nursing, Hannah took him to the tabernacle and literally gave him to God in the tabernacle to serve from that day on. This is where we pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 1. It starts out like this. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. 
Now, I'll just pause for a moment right there. It's believed that Samuel would have been about 12 years old when this story took place. Now, that's the, that's the age of my youngest son, Eli. And so when we're reading this story about God calling Samuel, we, we're reading the story about a, a pre-teenager, a young person. And so, and so the story isn't just about how do we discern or decipher God's voice in our life. But it's about how, how, do we, how do we position our young people in our life to hear God's voice. So let's keep that in mind as we, as we read the scripture. Verse 1 continues, Now in those days messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite un- uncommon. Now I think this is a polite way of saying God was speaking, but the people weren't listening. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> The, the, the people were boxing God out. Now, those of you who, who are watching the basketball playoffs right now, you, you know what boxing out is all about. All the, all the teams that are left, they're good, at, they're good at this because they know how to, how to get the rebounds. Boxing out is when you turn your back and, and you keep the other players from making it through so you can get, get the rebound. Well, boxing out, this positioning, is good when you're playing basketball. But turning your back on God is not so good when you're trying to decipher uh, God's voice in your life. And so, how do we decipher God's voice? Well, first of all, it's all about positioning. It's all, it's all about how we pre- position ourselves to hear God's voice. Let's take a look at the next couple of verses and you'll see what I mean. Uh, Verse 2, one night Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Now look where Samuel was positioned. He's a 12-year-old sleeping in the room right next to where the ark of God is, which contained the Ten Commandments. In the Old Testament, we read that uh, people called this room the Holy of holies. This is where the presence of God resided. And so Samuel spent every day serving alongside Eli the priest in the tabernacle, and at night he slept in the room next to the presence of God. If anyone is in position to hear God's call, it's Samuel. Here's another sports analogy. Baseball managers are great at positioning their players on the field. Uh, Depending on who's uh, up to bat, managers may shift their players to one side of the field to increase their chances of receiving the ball hit to them. So uh, a couple of questions that, that, that makes us think about today is do we need to shift any part of our lives today so that we can receive God's calling on our lives? Do we need to shift our priorities? Or do we need to shift our schedules? Or or do we need to slow down or quiet down once in a while? It's all about being in the right position. Let's keep on reading. Verse 4, Suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel! Yes! Yes! Samuel Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, replied Eli. Go back to bed. So he did. I absolutely love the readiness of Samuel. He's like fast asleep and he hears this voice and he wakes up and he believes it's Eli and he runs straight to him. He doesn't like, he isn't grumpy because he's woken up too early, but he just runs right to him. Eli, what, what do you need, he asked. <laughs> we go on to, to verse 6. And then the Lord calls out again, Samuel. And again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. And this is one of those uh, examples where God doesn't give up. God keeps calling. In this case, he, he's calling Samuel not, not just twice, but we'll see it happens a third time as well. But Samuel doesn't give up either. He keeps running to Eli. This is persistence. And I think sometimes when it comes to hearing God's call in our lives, we, we may lack persistence. We, we give up too easily. 
Or maybe a better word um, that we could use here is the word practice. How do we decipher God's call in our lives? We do it through practice. It takes practice to, to decipher God's voice from the other voices in our lives. Just like anything else in life that's worth doing well, we practice. Um, it's like my, my boys uh, throwing the lacrosse ball back and forth to each other. The more they practice, the, the better they get at doing it. The same is true when it comes to hearing God's call. The more we practice, you know, the more we do it, the better we get at it. Let's move on to verse 7. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time. And once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. Now let's not miss Eli's willingness uh, either in the story, right? This is a great example of what discipleship looks like. Eli has been um, mentoring this young boy all the way up to this point and he sees an opportunity to teach Samuel what it means to, to hear and to respond to God's call. This is a moment that's going to change Samuel's life forever. See, we have the ability to do the same for the young people in our lives as well. And it's so worth it, right? Look, look what happens in the scripture, verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. God upped the game a little bit this time, right? The scripture says God stood right there in front of Samuel and he calls out his name twice, Samuel, Samuel. And what's beautiful about the story is that it's not just the first time and it's not just the second time. And I don't think it mattered if it would have been a third or fourth time. I believe God would keep on calling. The point is that God continues to be active in our lives calling out to us and it takes the right positioning and practice to decipher what God's voice sounds like and do you remember what Samuel's response was it was speak your servant is listening or one of the commentaries I read this week suggests that Samuel's words were more like I'm ready to hear what you speak. I'm ready to hear what you speak. Making ourselves ready to hear God's call is more than just opening our ears, but this is more like a, a posture, right? <laughs> it's the posture that we take in our lives that tells God, you have my full attention, God. It's a posture of obedience and humility. God, what we're saying with this posture is, God, what you have to say is important to me. I'm ready to hear your call. Well, let's hit the pause button right there for this week. <laughs> we'll continue next week to discover how God um, is at work in our lives. But let's prepare our hearts right now for our time of communion uh, coming up here real soon. And let's say this, this prayer together. Our loving God, we recognize that you are not silent and confess that we are not listening. We crave your voice in our lives and pray that we will be ready to hear it when you speak. Amen. Amen.
As we come to this time of Holy Communion, I want to remind you that the invitation is to everyone 
uh, to participate with us. And this isn't mine or Hope Collective Church's invitation, but from, a, from an all-loving God. And so, uh, will you join us? I, I'll be reading from, as usual, the, the book of Contemporary Liturgy, and uh, the words will be on the screen for you to follow along. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Threefold and glorious God, in fatherly joy you created all things through the grace of your word in the wisdom of your spirit. In the depths of your love for the world you gave your only Son that all who might come to new life in your spirit. You rolled away the stone by your motherly hand and in the power of your spirit raised your incarnate Son from the dead. In your mercy you breathed your spirit on the fearful disciples, giving them the fire of your love to live as the body of your Son. And so adoring you with apostles and prophets, with martyrs and saints, with angels and archangels, we celebrate the glory of your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord God, there is none beside you. You are perfect in power, in love, and in purity. You invite us to join you at your heavenly banquet that knows no end. In this meal, we, we recall the sacrifice of your Son and the sanctification of your Spirit. Send that Spirit now upon us, that we may be ready to be your companions and on these gifts of your bread and juice. That they, that they may be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who at supper, when he was with his disciples, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you as often as you eat of this, remember. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup again, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you. This is my blood shed for you. It represents a new connection between your Creator and you. And as often as you drink of this, remember. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Triune God, in the dance of your love, we see your nature as utter relationship. Be close to all who struggle in relationship at home, in the workplace, across social divides, and national thresholds. As your three persons gaze in shared attention, look upon those who, whose lives go unrecognized. As your three members work together in true partnership, uphold any who face the struggle of their life alone. As your partners in the Trinity, unity relish one another in deep delight. Revitalize those who live without joy or hope. Make your church a community across time and space that enjoys the gift of your life and imitates the wonder of your love. Unite all who come into your presence and gaze upon your glory. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Amen. Friends, will you say the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for each of you. Take and eat and remember. The blood of Christ shed for each of you for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, and remember.
Holy God, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you all the glory. May we be filled up today so that we can hear your calling and so that we can share your love with the people around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, my name is Bob Bowden. My pronouns are he and him. Thank you for joining us in worship today. We like to share our mission statement every week so you know who we are. Hope Collective Church exists to develop inclusive communities where people discover sacred worth and calling. And our four core values are empathy, inclusion, trust, and humility. We are very excited to be one of the major sponsors of Dayton Pride, which is coming up next weekend. If you would like to volunteer during the parade or sitting at our booth on Saturday, the easiest way of letting us know is by emailing us at admin at hopecollectivechurch.org and we will get you set up with an opportunity. Also, the Dayton P Flag organization is sponsoring a 5K run or walk with Pride next Sunday at 9 a.m. You may register for that event on their website, which is pflagdayton.org. Many of you have been so generous with your financial gifts. We could not exist without your generosity. Anyone who would like to contribute toward our mission may do so by visiting hopecollectivechurch.org and click on the Give link. Thanks again for your generosity. Again, it's been an honor to be in worship with you. May your week be filled with hope. And remember these three words from God. You are loved. Amen. Yours is the glory forever. Amen.